Thank you for tuning in to Hill Country Fellowship's audio podcast. We hope you're encouraged and inspired as you listen today. For more information, visit us online at hcfburnett.org. I'm going to open us in prayer. I'll ask you to, to, to turn to Isaiah 30, although we won't get there right away if you have your, your Bible or your apps. and uh, You can go there. We're going to get to that in just a moment, but I'll open us in prayer. Father, I thank you for uh, this group of people that said, let's go gather and fellowship with one another and worship the King together. Uh, and I pray that you would honor us today just for, just for following you in this easy, faithful thing to do, just by getting up and coming here and, and being here, maybe tuning in online or listening on the radio, just saying, I'm going I'm to tune in to what Jesus has for me today. And, and so, Father God, would you speak to us through your Holy Spirit today? I know you will help us to hear. Help us to hear what the Spirit of the living God says and help us to respond in whatever way it is we need to respond. And as we look at your providence, that big aspect of uh, of your character uh, that's overarching throughout history and even beyond history, uh, that we would would be not, not... not blown away in a like scared or confused way, but we'd be overwhelmed by your goodness towards us, that you are for us. So bless us today, and, uh, and may, we, uh, may we walk out of here more like Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. So we are looking at, at Providence today, and, uh, and because this is Grad Sunday, uh, Michael's going to be closing us in, in the message and leading us into our last two songs of of worship as the Lord's put this on his heart. Number one, this is the character trait of God that just, uh, you know, pops off the page for him, but also because uh, we have all these grads uh, that we want to honor and bless and, and just speaking life and hope over them. Uh, and, and I would just say to all those who are up here and, and maybe those that, that couldn't be here today, uh, we're just very proud of you and we're very honored that uh, we get to be a part of your, your life. And, uh, and I believe wholeheartedly in you that you can go out there and uh, whether you're going to San Marcos, because there's a lot of you going to San Marcos, uh, Texas State kind of wins the day uh, here, uh, or, or you're going up north, up in the, the DFW area, or maybe far north uh, in the northern world of Lubbock, um, or wherever it might be, uh, that, that you know you carry the living God with you. So everywhere you go, you have the authority of Jesus that, that leads the way, and there's no fear. This world wants you to be afraid and then not know what to do with it. And Jesus says, I got this. And you got me, so we're good. So, so be encouraged. As we were talking about um, planning the, the service uh, this week, uh, there's a story that came to, to actually to Jeremy's mind, uh, and he just kind of pitched it out there, and then we talked about it, and Michael's like, that's a great one. So I, I want to share, st- share with you a story of God's providence because his providence looks like a billion different things throughout the lives of all those that follow him. Uh, but back in 1993, uh, I, I led a team to, to China on mission, and we were there for about four months. Uh, and we had some amazing successes, and we had some, at the time, horrific lows uh, up and down, culminating in getting arrested in Beijing. Uh, and some of you have heard that story before. Uh, but there's this one part where, where we had... We had crossed the border from Hong Kong back when it was free Hong Kong, uh, and we crossed into Shenzhen, uh, the, the city right there, uh, and we, we smuggled in a lot of Bibles and tracts um, for, a, for a full day, and we just smuggled back and forth, and we went back like seven times back and forth just smuggling, and then our last smuggle, we took the ones that we were going to carry with us throughout China for the, for the uh, four months, and so we had about 400 Bibles. Uh, we had about 4,000 tracks with us that were basically just the how to become a, a believer, uh, salvation message there uh, that we took with us. And, and we traveled to a couple of different towns. We get to this one region called Huainan, which uh, in China was really small. It was about a half a million people. So it was like, you know, a podunk town to them. Uh, and at the time we got there, uh, what we learned was it's the bean curd capital of China, tofu, uh, and they're having the bean curd festival. I was like, oh, who cares? Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> where's the beef? Uh, but, um, but it was great. There was this festival, but as crazy as it was with all those people in this, in this, in this yearly event they had in China, like we we're the only white people in town of half a million people. Uh, so we stood out as an anomaly in one way. We we're not only white, but then we're Americans. And that's like, hmm. Um, and, and so we kind of just stood out like a sore thumb uh, and we're going about doing our business. We wake up every day and ask the Lord what to do. And 
Then we go do it. That was, that was our plan, which really was hard on me because uh, I wanted like a four-month plan. But, but that was okay. Uh, Holy Spirit's in charge, not me. So we had all these Bibles, uh, and, and I'll show you a picture of one of them. Uh, so that we, we call them the ugly yellow school bus Bibles. So we had 400 of those. That they, they stood out a little bit, just so you're aware. And of course, that says Holy Bible in Chinese right there. So that's the Bibles we carried in with us, and we had them in a few suitcases, and, and we'd, we'd hand them out as we would go. When you were making our way to Beijing, that was our final stop. Um, and so we had these bright yellow Bibles that you could see across the region. And uh, so we get to Huinan, and it's all great, and we're doing fine, and all of a sudden, somebody reports us for giving them a Bible, and the Red Guard, the Chinese army, shows up with the uh, mayoral officials and, and the city officials and all that, and they're like, we show up at our hotel, and they're like, we want the contraband. And we're like, what contraband? You know, uh, we're not great actors, and we didn't show it at all. Um, and so the Bibles happened to be in the room of the girls that were with us. So we had three hotel rooms, and they're like, we're investigating your room. Take us to your room. So I looked at one of the girls, and I said, go tell Joe, he was on our team, <laughs> to hide the Bibles, and we'll go into that room last. And she's like, okay. What I didn't think through was Joe panics more than anybody on the planet ever. I didn't think that through until the moment we finally walked into this hotel room. So I want you to try to picture it. So there's this giant suitcase, the old school kind of uh, hard, hard plastic ones. It's open with every Bible in it. I don't know, Joe like shook it up and then said, I don't know what he did. He's straddling this. He's got the mattress of the full size bed propped up with a chair and he's shoveling the Bibles as fast as he can. So they're just coming into this lump in the middle of the mattress. And I'm like, if you got it all done somehow and then move the chair, it would, you know, what dead bodies under there would be the first question. So he's straddling. We walk in. The red guard, me. Uh, I don't know how we fit like nine of us in that little hotel room, but we were all standing there. And Joe's like, uh-oh. And I walk in. I'm like, oh, no, we're dead. We're just, we're dead. And, and they walk in, and the main official says, where are the Bibles? And I was like, what? Where are the Bibles? And Joe's like, what? And he's 6'4", lanky, skinny. I mean, he's got legs like up to here. And he's in his like, even, like he, we were about to go to bed, so he's like in his shorts that he wore. And, and he's pasty, milk white legs. And, and he's standing there, and I'm like, and my first thought is, like, do they even see Joe? Like, I didn't, do they see Joe? Do they think he's squatting? I mean, I don't know what's going on, but they're like, we want the Bibles. And I'm like, but they're right there. And they're like, give us the Bibles. We know you have Bibles. They told us you have Bibles. They're bright yellow. And I'm like, no, I don't know what to do here, Lord. And, and it's funny, there's a closet door over here, a little sliding uh, door over here, and and in it, the girls had their suitcases open. In one of the suitcases, with all the clothes, there's, there's one of those Bibles on top of her suitcase. And the Lord says, go give them that Bible. So I looked over and I said, oh, we have one over here. And I walk over, around Joe there, you know. And, and I walk over to the closet and I pick it up and they're like, ha! We knew you had contraband Bibles. I'm like, yes, we do. And I'm still thinking, and then the girls are like looking and going, and they're, they're all, they're both, all the girls are short and these red guard are tall guys. And they're like, what are, what are we missing here? And I'm like, oh, what are we missing here? And, and it was just this crazy moment, the whole thing. And they get it and they look and like, this is it. You're in trouble. And I'm like, I know. I'm in so much trouble. And like, you're coming with us and you're going to sign a paper that says, you brought this Bible. I'm like, I will. Uh, and so we go, and we go to this room, and they, they bring out this camera, and they, fi they filmed everything back in the 90s. Uh, I don't know if they were going to try to put it somewhere or just have evidence that it was the, like the China thing to do. Uh, and, and so they're filming us, and they'd written out this thing about how I brought in a Bible, and I'm like, I brought in a Bible, and I had to sign it and all this. And, and they watched us after that, but so we get back, and of course we get back, and, and they're all just praying, the people, the team in the room, and and. And they're like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know, what happened? And they're like, well, what happened? I'm like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and then one of the girls is like, well, God just blinded their eyes in one way or another or every way possible. If we had become friends 
If I'd written the script for a sitcom, they'd have all gotten saved, we'd become friends, and I'd have been like, did you see Joe there? You know? And, yeah, we saw a guy squatting. We don't, I don't know. I would have loved to have asked him the question, what in the world did you see or not see there? Because the scene was as, as crazy as you could imagine it, uh, and we should have all gone to jail, at least for the night. Um, but God's providence is this. He's for you. The ultimate meaning of God's providence, as deep as you get it in, in, in Hebrew or going back in time, whatever language you want to go and however deeply theological you want to go to, God's for us. He's for us and he will do whatever it takes for you and for his glory. He just is. That's the providence of God. It's not like, I got to figure out this perfect, what providence means. He's for you. He's for you. He's for you. There's a passage that passage in Isaiah 30 speaks of God's providence for us. And, and we see his providence for us all throughout scripture, all throughout history, God's providence in our lives. No matter what we do or, or what happens, or what struggles we face, he's for us. And I was praying for someone this week and the Lord put this passage on my, on my heart. I think it was Thursday morning. Put this passage on my heart and as I was reading it, and I was, I was typing it out and going to send him an encouragement. Uh, he's like, that's, that's me. That's what I do. That's my providence, Scott. I'm like, oh, not only can I encourage someone, but then I can use it on Sunday. It's awesome. Uh, so we see this beautiful and powerful commitment to us in Isaiah 30. Uh, he he, he, he kind of lists all this challenging, hard stuff that goes on. Sometimes we lump it on ourselves. And then we see... God telling his people, I'm waiting to show you my favor, my mercy, my love, my compassion. I'm faithful to those who, who choose to wait for me. I will come to them and I will meet them there. Those who trust me to help them because I'm for you. And then in verse 20 of Isaiah 30, it says, even though the Lord may allow you to go through a season of hardship and difficulty, he himself will be there with you. He will not hide himself from you, for your eyes will constantly see him as your teacher. When you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear his voice behind you to guide you, saying, This is the right path. Follow it. And then it goes on down in verse 23. It says, Then God will supply you with abundant rain for the seeds you sow. He will bless you with an incredible, plentiful harvest. And in that day, he will give you a lush, broad pastures for your cattle. That's the God you have on your side. When he uses that word teacher, it actually, another meaning for that is, is, is rain. He's like, you, you do what you're called to do, plant. I'm going to show you my favor, my blessing, my providence by, by raining down so that it grows well. Paul even refers to it later uh, when he talks about, I, I'm not the one that that, that makes it all grow. I, I do my part. I plant. And then, and then he rains down. It's the same reference there. He brings the rain. He brings the growth. He does what he needs to do for the, for the, for the advancement of his kingdom, for his glory, and, and for your good. When, when Michael's done today, we're going we're gonna to sing a couple songs at the end. One talking about the goodness of God and just declaring that. And the other one praising him in, in response by, by saying, because you're good, this is how I'm going to live my life. The song uh, refers to my, my hands being open. I want you to hear this as Michael makes his way up here to, uh, to, to take it home for us. We'll sing, hands open, heart free. God rain down on me. Live expectant. We sing about living expectant. Not hesitant or reluctant, but expectant. Believing him to be provident in our lives and be for us. Don't beat yourself up. Don't belittle yourself. Don't let people try to define you when God has already defined you. Live expectant of, what the, of all the good things he has for you. He misses nothing. He misses nothing and you're his favorite. So he never misses you. He never misses you. Pastor Michael. Thanks, Scott. Man, so I could, I could just... We could wrap it up now. I'm ready to, to sing and worship. Um, Y'all can go ahead and, and turn over to Genesis uh, chapter 22 is when we're, where we're going to land today. Um, 
I need to make sure I don't drink Scott's water bottle. Uh, but yeah, a while back when, when, Scott, okay, when Scott was starting this series and, and talking to us about uh, what is your favorite thing about God, what have you seen most in his life, in, in your life about him, and the, the first thing I, I definitely thought of was his providence. Um, his providence has, has been all over my life. Um, how good he is, how he, he works everything out, like even in the little details when you look at it. Um, so to, today it's going to tie in a lot with last week, what Scott and Josh talked about with God's goodness. And so I definitely encourage you to go back and watch that online if you missed it. It was so much good stuff there about God's goodness. Um, so consider this a part two to that. Um, God's, God's goodness and God's providence, uh, they, they go hand in hand. They're in the same conversation so often. And I've seen both of those in my life in so many ways. He's, he's been so good to me. Um, I want to share a couple of, of personal stories on that because uh, I think God, God blesses us each in unique ways to, to share that and, and point others to him. And so one of the biggest things that God did in my life that, that showed his providence to me uh, was about 10 years ago, um, I felt called to youth ministry. And um, I, uh, I had been registered to go to Baylor University as an engineering major, and uh, I was pretty good at math. It came naturally to me. And, and so I was planning on going there and, and becoming an engineering and presumably making a decent amount of money when I was done with that. And, and so whatever amount of college debt uh, probably wouldn't be that big of an issue for that when everything was said and done. But then whenever God completely changed the direction of my life by calling me into ministry, it raised some, some concerns. And uh, talking with my mom especially, my, my mom came to visit. Thanks for being here, mom. Uh, but we were, we were talking, and it was like, how are we going to make this work? You know, because I haven't looked it up recently, but 10 years ago, Baylor, four years there, was going to cost around $200,000. We definitely did not have that in the bank, and so I uh, wasn't sure what to do. I was young and dumb, and uh, so I didn't even consider the thought of not going to an expensive school like Baylor, um, but I was, I was at least not foolish enough to run from what God had called me to. I, I was going to do what he wanted me to do. And, and so, um, by the way, seniors, listen, listen to wise advice. Like, read that book that, that we got you. Uh, listen to your, your parents or your elders. Um, whatever, whatever wisdom is coming into your life, life, listen to it. Don't just blindly run into whatever the rest of the world is doing because that's, that's not a good path to go down. I somewhat did that. Uh, but I, I was at least wise enough to, um, to pursue what God was calling me to. And so I did go to Baylor as a religion major. And, uh, uh, but I followed wise advice, uh, particularly from my mom, of, of applying for every scholarship that I could and, and taking every opportunity I could. And then time after time, every semester, every year, uh, I had just enough to, to, make it, to make it by every semester. Um, God provided me with... Uh, scholarship opportunities. He provided me with, yeah, I, I praise God for that. Um, parents helping me out, job opportunities, summer internships, coming back home here. Um, and then I was able to, to go another three years in seminary and, and finish that debt free. And I, I used to struggle sharing that story and uh, like I didn't want to like brag or something. Uh, but I, I came to realize that God blessed me in that way so that I could, could share and testify about what he's done in my life. Um, so I could I, I more freely now share that and, and brag on God. Um, but that's not it. Like, he has done so much in my life in, in so many ways. I could take my entire time here just, just sharing the ways that God has, has been at work in my life and counting my blessings. I'm sure most of, of y'all could do the same. Um, ask me sometime about how God is... Uh, provided um, when I was really, really stupid and flipped my car in high school, and he protected me from that, um, how he provided me an awesome, supportive family, how he brought me and Amy back home to burn it uh, when we were done with school and, and back here to my home church, how he provided for, for me and my family when my dad died, uh, plenty of other stories that I could share. Uh, but I do want to share uh, one with y'all that we... Uh, that I mentioned kind of in the video uh, was about our, our kids. Uh, so Amy got to celebrate her first Mother's Day a couple weeks ago on, on the receiving end. And, um, but even, even some of our friends don't know yet that uh, there was a, 
there was a time for a, about a year-long period where we weren't totally sure if we were going to be able to have kids. And uh, it, was, it was nothing like um, how intense what, what uh, Josh was sharing about him and Kayla last week. Uh, but we, it did uh, make us wrestle with our faith. And, uh, but God provided for us in multiple ways that we were able to have Brady. Um, so beyond just getting pregnant, uh, when, when he was actually born, uh, it, it, God had to provide or Brady wouldn't have made it. Um, the doctors referred to him as a miracle baby. Um, so Amy's pregnancy went, went great, uh, other than what I'm sure any mom in here knows the, how awful <laughs> that can, can be during that process, but everything went normal. Um, but when Brady was born, it wasn't so smooth. Uh, during the delivery process, we heard a, uh, his heart rate drop a couple times, and, and the doctors told us they might need to check on him once he's born, and, but they didn't, it didn't sound too serious, nothing uh, too serious. But whenever Brady did arrive, it wasn't the, the screaming, crying that I was expecting. It was silent. And uh, he wasn't moving, and he was colorless. His cord uh, was wrapped around his neck, and it was tied in a knot. And so he wasn't breathing. It, it, it led to his respiratory system not activating right whenever he came out. So the doctors, they immediately took him over to the table across the room to do their thing and, and help him out. And the next five minutes were the most terrified I've ever been in my entire life. Um, the, the doctors, they, they had comforting words for Amy and I while they were, were working. And, but from my point of view and what I could see, it, it, it was not looking good. And it wasn't encouraging. And in the report, when everything was said and done, it was at the five and a half minute mark that Brady took his first breath on his own. Um, and from then on, he was off to the races. He recovered so quickly. Uh, he did have to go to the NICU, but only for three days, um, and he's been great ever since then. Um, praise God, he'll be two months uh, this coming Tuesday. So um, I'm just, I'm so thankful for how God provided that in my life. Um, he, he allowed our fertility treatments. He allowed the right doctors. He allowed the, the right tools at the hospital to be available to us to make sure that Brady was going to be here and bless our family. Um, and then speaking of our, our family, uh, I mentioned that we went from zero to three kids. Um, the, the adoption I, I mentioned there, it, it is not final yet, so they're not officially ours, but uh, Johnny and Caleb have, have just been blessing our family in, in such an awesome way. It's so cool how God has worked that in our lives. Um, Amy and I, we had both talked about wanting to adopt uh, from even back whenever we were dating, but we never talked too serious or, or made an exact plan about that. Um, well, fast forward to two years married. Uh, we were in the middle of COVID shutdowns, struggling with infertility, um, and our, our friends had been fostering a child, and they needed help with a babysitter. So Amy and I decided to go through the process and get certified to babysit for them and help them out. And so that gets the conversation going again for us. And uh, long story short, uh, God, God used that to, to lead us towards fostering ministry and in hopes of maybe adopting one day. Um, but little did we know he was going to use that to bring us Johnny and Caleb in our very first placement um, in a relatively quick timeline of, of adopting them and bringing them into our family. Um, another side note of that, you can ask me later for the sake of time, but God used even our dog to uh, point us in that direction. It's, it's just so cool, all the little details that he uses, um, and he works in every one of those details. He's threading everything together for his purpose. I've seen that in my life. So it was, it was super clear to me when Scott asked what the favorite thing is about God, his providence. And so I wanted to share that with y'all. And then... When I decided on that, I, I got to researching and looking at scripture on God's providence, and it turns out it is such a bigger topic uh, than, than just that. Really, any of us can wrap our minds around. So in Genesis chapter 2, um, many, many Christians, or if you've grown up in church especially, you're familiar with uh, referring to God by various different names, and one of those being Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord will provide. That comes from here in Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, I'm going to read, starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the NLT today. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. 
The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yara, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear to you, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. So Abraham shows amazing faith and trust in God here. Like he's called to kill his son, the, the son that God promised him and brought him through so much. He had come so far. He had seen God be so faithful. So, so surely he was misunderstanding God or something, right? But no, Abraham knew. He knew it was what God had told him. And he knew that God would make a way. Like even if the human calculation wasn't adding up, he knew God had it all accounted for. He told his servants that they would come right back. And in in Hebrews 11, verse 19, if you want to look that up, it shows us that Abraham, he was trusting God to bring Isaac back from the dead. So he says, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Yireh, or Jehovah Jireh, the, the modern way of translating that word. So the Lord will provide. God's providence. I do want to get into that that word a little bit in the language. What does that really mean? The dictionary entry, it says that to provide is to make preparation for a need. You know, we we provide for our children. We do our best to be prepared for the rainy days. And then for for providence, the dictionary, it, it recognizes that that's divine, that God is the one making the preparations. But let's look for a little bit where the, the word comes up in the story. Isaac asks, where's the sacrifice? And then Abraham says, God will provide himself a sheep. Provide, it's somewhat of a translating liberty that we take with the Hebrew word there, yaira. Um, it, that's the future tense of the Hebrew word ra'ah, which is a super common word. It, it comes up over 1,300 times in the Old Testament. Ra'ah, it means to see, literally to see. So, so literally what Abraham was telling him there is the Lord will see himself a sheep. Or in other, other words, we might say the Lord will see to it. See to it. That, that's kind of a weird phrase, but we use it, right? That shows the deeper meaning of providing. We see to it. We, we make sure it will happen. We take an active role in taking care of a need. And so this, this word in our translations today, provide, it comes from a Latin word, pro and vide. Pro and vide. Vide means to see. You know, I, I came, I saw, I conquered. Vine, vide, vice. Vide means to see. And then pro means before or on behalf of. You know, God is for us. So provide, it literally means to, to see before or to see on behalf of. So when we provide for our loved ones, we're doing everything in our power 
to see things before they happen, to prepare for, for needs before they're there, to take care of things on behalf of someone. But the thing is, we can't see the future. Us providing for others, it's always in a limited sense because we never truly see the need in, until it's our current reality. But with God, he truly provides. He truly pro vide. He really does see ahead and know exactly what's needed before it's our current reality. He truly can take care of our needs and see to it exactly how we need him to. My, my dad was a preacher, and uh, growing up, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to his sermons, but I do remember something he said over and over is that two words you don't find in the Bible are oops and uh-oh. Because God's never surprised, right? He's never surprised by something like we are. He's never caught off guard. There's nothing that could possibly be in your future that God doesn't already see and have it accounted for. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, verse 8, he said that God knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. And then in, down in verse 32 and 33, he said that worry dominates the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Amen. So everything we need, do we, do we really believe that? God will see to it. He already sees everything coming around the corner. He's already got it accounted for. He loves you. He's for you. He is a good father. He knows your needs and he's seeing to it. So do we trust him with that? That's the, the number one thing we learn here with Abraham is that we can trust God, that he'll see to it. God's providence means that we can trust him. So when God sees to it, we respond first by trusting him. Abraham, he had, he had heard God, he walked in obedience, he saw God provide, so he knew he could trust him. So we can trust that God is going to see to it in our lives. But what did, what did Abraham's response of trust look like? Was it active in obedience, or, or was it just passive? There was a, there was a man who he, he once was caught in a, in a flood. There was a bad flood, and he was trapped in his house. And it was, it was getting so bad, he eventually had to climb onto his roof. And, uh, and he believed in God, so he trusted God. He prayed that God would save him. And uh, not too long after that, his neighbor came by on a kayak. Um, I, I think he had a fishing pole and a, and a GoPro. It might have been Trey Carpenter, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if Trey's here or not, but his neighbor comes by in a kayak. He's like, hey, I've got some room. Do you need help? And the man says, no, thanks. God will save me. And it starts getting worse and worse. And there's some police rescue boats coming by and they spot him and, and they say, hey, uh, come to us or, or we're coming to you. We're, we'll rescue you. And he says, no, thanks. God will save me. And then it, it starts getting even worse to where there, there's no room up, but on the tip of his roof and a helicopter spots him and they let a ladder, a ladder down and they say, Climb up, we'll rescue you. And he says, no thanks, God will save me. He's still confident. Well, eventually the floodwaters rise and, and he ends up drowning in the flood. And he was a believer, so he goes to heaven and, and he sees God and he says, God, I trusted you, why didn't you save me? And God said, wake up, I sent you three people to rescue you, right? It's a dumb story, but it, it demonstrates the point. Trust can't mean that we just sit idly by in order to, to trust God, when the very thing that God provided for us is right there. Our faith in God's providence, it must be active and obedient. God has provided us all with so much wisdom already right here in his word. But how many of us are, are trusting God to come through for us in, in our finances? We need him to, to see to it. When so much of wisdom of how to handle that is already provided to us right here. How many of us are, are trusting God to, to heal our bodies? We need him to see to it, and yet we eat endless amounts of junk food and, and don't diet and exercise right. How many of us are trusting God to provide us a, a sense of belonging and community and connection, and yet we, we act like coming to church in person is, is too much of a hassle, or we're not willing to get plugged in and, and serve and into small groups like God calls us to in his word. How many of us are, are trusting God to work a miracle in our marriage or in our children, but then we, we're not willing to step up and, and be the spouse or be the parent that God calls us to be in his word? 
How many single people are, are trusting God to provide you that spouse that you're looking for, but you're pursuing that in a complete opposite way of what God has provided, wisdom in his word? It's like, like me with YouTube. Um, y'all discovered YouTube, right? It's like endless amounts of these really awesome professional teachers that will teach you anything on YouTube. It's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none type of guy. It's a blessing and a curse. But uh, Amy, uh, walking around the house, she'll always hear me listening to whatever the latest YouTube video is of, about drumming or uh, playing guitar or <clears throat> woodworking or car maintenance or a debate or wh- whatever the recommendation is that week. She'll probably get sick of hearing me listen to these. I love hearing all this wisdom. Um, but the thing is, I never actually practice it. I never actually go and get better at any of those things. God has given us exactly what we need, so much wisdom right here, and yet we're surprised how our life turns out when we don't practice it. When we find ourselves in trouble because of our own foolishness, then we're content to, to sit back and trust God to see to it. We trust his providence But his providence was giving us access to this wisdom in the first place. God's providence leads us to an active trust, not just sitting back assuming that he'll do do it for us. And when God sees to it, we respond by actively trusting him in obedience. I love this, uh, this Dave Ramsey quote. He says, God feeds the birds, but he doesn't throw the worms into the nest. God's providence doesn't negate our responsibility. I say all that, and yet, even in those times that we're lazy or disobedient or unfaithful or foolish, just lacking wisdom, God still sees to it, doesn't he? He still does. It's never too late for God to see to it. How many of us have been that man standing on the roof in his house and and foolishly ignoring what God gave us, and yet God was still patient to bear with us and see to it in the midst of our failures and our foolishness? I've seen that in my life. And so what about you? How, is, how has God provided for you in your past? How has he come through? Even when it looked like there was no way, there, there really was something right around the corner that he had accounted for. How did God see to it in your life? Whether you were actively obedient, trusting God like Abraham was, or, or maybe you were being foolish. Whatever it is, write that down. Remember what God has done. Count your blessings. And let those be the foundation in your life to always know what God can do. The the second thing, what do we see in Abraham's response to God's providence? Well, he responds by trusting God, and then in verse 14, he names the place Yahweh Yireh, or Jehovah Jireh. Abraham, he also responded by worshiping. He commemorated what God did. He made sure to always remember. He made sure as many people as possible were going to know and hear about God's great providence in his life. So for us, as as we count our blessings and we recognize God's providence in our life, we should be moved to worship. When God sees to it, we respond in worship. Is worship becoming stale in your life? I know it's hard (laughs) here with with such an awesome, talented team leading us. But is is it routine or dull? Like no matter how awesome the band is or what songs we sing or what's going on in your life, the answer is to remember Look back and see how God has seen to it in your life. See his faithfulness and be moved to worship. Uh, that's, that's why I asked Josh to, to sing that song uh, during the offering, the evidence song. And then we're, we're also going to sing goodness of God in our response time. We sang that one last week, but uh, it's just so perfect for this topic. As we look at God's goodness and faithfulness in our lives, as we see the evidence in our lives that God has seen to it, we respond by worshiping. Not even, not even out of obligation, but we're just so thankful. We're just in awe of how good he is and what he's done. We can't help but sing to him. And then, so third, what does, how do we respond to God's providence? What did God say to Abraham after he provided the sacrifice? He said he will bless him and all his descendants. And then there in verse 18, And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So God, God seeing to it in Abraham's life, it wasn't just to bless Abraham. Like it it was definitely to bless Abraham and draw him into a deeper relationship with God for sure. But it couldn't stop there. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. 
God saw to it in Abraham's life so that Abraham could bless others. This is our, our third response to God's providence. When God sees to it in our lives, we respond by blessing others. We respond by being the hand of God's providence in someone else's life. Think about it. How often has God seen to it in your life? By using someone else to do it. Where would you be if it weren't for, for that person or those people, if they hadn't been there? Now, now, what if God, what if there's someone out there in need of God to see to it in their life, and God wants to use you to take care of it in his work of providence? What has he provided you? Has he provided you a, a home? Provided you healing? Provided you a, a family, a skill, or, or set of resources, financial blessings? Seniors, he's provided you a blank slate to build your life however you want to moving forward. Whatever he's provided you, use it to bless others. As we count our blessings and see how God has seen to it in our lives, when God sees to it, we respond by trusting him, by worshiping him, and blessing others. And yet still, sometimes it feels like there's none to see. It feels like there's no blessings to count. Maybe you're there this morning. Maybe you honestly can't think of a significant blessing in your life right now, or, or maybe even ever. It might feel like God has never taken care of your needs, or there was at least one significant need where he didn't come through, he didn't see to it. I've, I've never felt true despair before, but I've, I've definitely had my fair share of heartaches. Um, I, I love sharing about where God has come through in my life, but there's been times where it, it felt like it was impossible to see what he was up to, like, like my need was there and he never, he never met it. Um, <clears throat> a lot of you know my, my dad died uh, pretty young of cancer. And uh, it, I'm, I'm amazed at the progress that modern medicine has, has made, but cancer is still largely a mystery. Um, and modern medicine, is, it, it's never perfect. It's not our God. It felt like God didn't answer our prayers for healing during that time. And God so far hasn't allowed science to progress that far. Um, and then some of you may, may have heard as well back in 2019, uh, I lost my sister to suicide. She had a, a long battle with uh, mental and physical illnesses. Despite our, our efforts and our prayers, it definitely felt like a loss. Like God didn't take care of that need in our lives. Like, like where is he in all of that? Healing is a real need, right? Like there, there's so many testimonies of God providing the healing to people, which is awesome. What about the times where it feels like he doesn't? I'm not, I'm not here to complain or, or have a pity party. Um, I know there, there's countless other people with, with harder things that they've walked through in their, their life. But where is God in that? I want us to turn to Romans chapter 8. This is uh, where Josh landed last week. And uh, so again, consider this part two of, of what we talked about last week. This is my, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. This is, this is the best chapter you could ever read if you don't know where to turn to in the Bible or, or where to get started. Romans chapter eight. This is the most fundamental truth to understanding God's providence and his goodness in our lives. I'm gonna start in verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Having chosen them, he called them to come to him. Having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? And then he goes on in that, that famous section about nothing can separate us from God's love. That's what Josh read last week. So think about God's providence, seeing our need ahead of time and taking care of us. All of us had the greatest need that, <clears throat> that we could ever have. We, we needed a savior. We were lost in our sin, deserving death and, and punishment. And God saw that need and he made a way. Verse 32, it says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? So God's providence and, and really every trait that we've seen of God so far in this series, 
It's shown most beautifully and most clearly in Jesus. Abraham said the the Lord will provide himself the sheep for the sacrifice, and, and here he is. Literally, God himself providing himself as the sacrifice. It's Jesus. Abraham didn't really have to sacrifice his son. Isaac carried the the wood up the hill, but he didn't really have to die. But God did give up his son, and Jesus did carry his cross up the hill and give his life up. So, So we look to Jesus, and we know no matter what is going on in our life, no matter how dark it may look, our darkest moments, the gospel shines through and shows us that God is there. He is for us. He is taking care of our deepest needs. So if, if, if we think about counting our blessings, if you were to literally list them out, I pray that for every one of us, it, the list begins and ends with Jesus. Everything else in that list is just icing on the cake and we can thank God all the more for it, but we all have Jesus. So when it feels like there is no, nothing to worship for, nothing to trust God for, remember Jesus. As we wrap up, I want to focus on verse 28. One of the biggest promises in the Bible. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. This is where God's providence comes to its head. God is, he's not only able to see ahead to provide for our needs, but he is actively working all things for our good. God will see to it that everything in our lives will work together for good. Everything. Those times when it looked like God didn't come through, those times when your need didn't get met, those times when it felt like God was totally absent, it doesn't make sense at all. He's still working it out. God sees the whole puzzle when all we see is the pieces. He has the eternal perspective. So the the promise for, for every believer is that every little detail in your life is part of God's providence. He's working your life out to have the greatest good possible. Every bump in the road is part of him seeing to it, even when it doesn't make sense. As the the band comes on stage, we wrap up. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, it says that now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. We see an imperfect view of God's providence now. We will always have at least some unanswered questions on this side of eternity, but we can know without a doubt that God is seeing to it to work it all for our good. One day when when every tear is wiped away, there's no more pain and no more suffering, we will see it clearly. Every struggle, excuse me, every heartache, every season of silence will make perfect sense. We will see perfectly how God was seeing to it the whole time. Every detail was in his great plan, his plan for his greatest glory and our greatest good. So take heart. As we we sing a couple more songs, let's count our blessings. Let's look at the, the goodness of God in our lives. Remember, Jesus and the gospel is at the top of that list, no matter how long or short that list is for you. As we see how God sees to it, let's respond by trusting him, by worshiping him, and blessing others. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your providence in in my life personally, um, and just how how you've worked in each of us individually. I'm sure we have a long list. But God, even when we don't see it, I, I pray that we can look to Jesus, that everything will make perfect sense one day, and we can trust you that you're working it all out for good, God. Uh, So as as we sing this song and and look at your goodness, I, I pray that we can see it clearly, as clearly as possible in the midst of whatever struggles we have this morning. God, we lay those at your feet. We respond to your providence by, by trusting you, by worshiping you. Help us to bless others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. For more sermons and full service replays, visit our media page on hcfburnett.org and follow us on social media. God bless and have a great week.